Okay, so today we're talking about Cartesian dualism. Now, the term Cartesian is from the Latinization of Descartes' name. So when we say Cartesian, we're really referring to René Descartes over here. He of the quizzical eyebrow. Um, Descartes, fascinating character, really the beginning of the uh, philosophical enlightenment. He, um, uh, I think, I think some of the most interesting things about him. A.C. Grayling, in his biography, uh, believe, accused Descartes of being a spy during the Thirty Years' War. He also, um, at the end of his life, went to work uh, as a tutor to a princess. Um, but the only time she could see him was at the first thing in the morning um, at about 5 a.m. Now, Descartes loved to get up at about midday. He thought he could um, lie in bed and, and think philosophical thoughts. Suddenly, he was getting up at 5 a.m. He contracted pneumonia and died. So Descartes quite literally died of early mornings. Anyway, Descartes, or this in this case Cartesian dualism, is all about this idea. The mind and body are distinct. Now, distinct is a key word here. Distinct does not mean separate. It rather means two different things. So if you think of a bottle of oil and a bottle of vinegar, for instance, those are separate things. The oil and the vinegar are separate things. But when we say distinct, what we mean is if you mixed the put the oil and the vinegar in the same glass, well, they would still be distinct objects, but they would not be separate. They'd exist in the same glass. And when Descartes is saying that the mind and the body are distinct, what he means is that they are different things, but they exist in the same kind of place, although places not quite the right term. Now, Descartes wrote uh, wrote uh, a book called Meditations on First Philosophy, which is where we're getting most of the ideas from here. And Cartesian dualism, remember, um, is, uh, it, is, it means Descartes dualism. It is the mind and body are distinct, but they also interact. So essentially the, the brain sends the, the mind signals and the mind sends the brain signals. Let's just go a little bit more in depth here in terms of, uh, in terms of what we're talking about. So the mind is over here, again represented excellently, I, I think you would agree. Uh, with um, uh, with my kind of weird squiggle. Um, the mind is this. It is a kind of non-physical thing. It is what we would call unextended. Unextended. That is Descartes' term. An unextended I, the me. Unextended, by the way, just to give you a definition, means no location and no no um, kind of measurement either. I'm going to write measure because I ran out of space, uh, but it would be measurement. Um, so no measurement at all. It 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 doesn't exist in a physical way, and so it doesn't have a location. That's really important for Descartes. It's not that it exists in a particular place, it doesn't. It exists in no place, because it is non-physical. The other part, of course, is the brain. The brain, now, that is physical. So, if you think about it for a second, if um, if the, the term for the mind, this non-physical thing, is unextended, of course, the brain is going to be an extended thing. Ooh. We are having some technical issues. There you go. Extended, which of course means that it has a location and space and so on. 
Now, the other important thing that I did note down here very briefly is this concept of the I here. It is the self, the mind, whereas the brain isn't the self as such. But they do, importantly, interact. So let's just go through Descartes' concept of interaction. What Descartes means by interaction is that they uh, connect with each other. Now, he thought that the only things that connect with each other, uh, the only things that have minds, are humans. And he said, well, look, everything else, no other animal has a pineal gland in the brain, whereas the, the human does, so that must be the place in the brain that the mind and the brain interact. He was wrong. Um, other animals do have a pineal gland, but he didn't know that. By the way, he tried to demonstrate that all other animals were mere what he called automata, uh, these um, kind of robots, um, by throwing dogs off his roof. Okay, anyway, <laughs> I've left a big space here, and I'm about to fill it. I'm about to fill all of that space. I want to know not just what this theory is, the non-physical mind and the physical brain that interact, I want to know why he thinks that. And the why is going to take up the rest. I've kind of shaded it in green here, so you know it's kind of the argument for. In order to understand why he thinks this, we need to essentially go back in time just a little bit. Okay, we need to go back in his, sorry, not in time, in his theory a bit to fully unpack it. There's a reason why Descartes was famous. The reason in philosophy that Descartes is famous is that he changed the approach to philosophy. Everyone up until Descartes followed the original thoughts of Plato and Aristotle. Descartes said, I'm going to get rid of that tradition that the church followed of, Descartes, of, of Plato and Aristotle, and I'm going to start again. I'm going to ask, what are the firm foundations in science? Science rests upon my belief in the physical world and the reliability of my senses. So I'm going to start by questioning that. So the method of doubt has a very particular aim. The aim is to find what we call indubitable knowledge. Indubitable knowledge is knowledge that can't possibly be doubted. Okay? Now, the method to establish that is to reject, is to perform what we call a thought experiment. We're going to reject as false, as, or at least as if it were false, as if it were false, anything that could be false. Now, the could is really important here. It's not that um, his arguments that we're going to look at in just a second prove that things are not true. Rather, the method here is to find this indubitable knowledge. The method is to find knowledge that can't be doubted. So he's going to reject anything that could be doubted. And of course, he's going to start with the senses. And this is where he produces his dream argument down here. He says, well, you know, everything could be a dream. All, all of my senses could be reporting a dream. You, you, you've had dreams uh, that, are, that appear real. Um, how do you know you're not in one right now? Well, you don't for sure. You don't indubitably know. So you have to reject your current sensations. Okay, so here we doubt the senses. But Descartes says, look, just like a, a painter will take colours 
from a palette and look at objects and then paint those. So your dream would also be drawing on colours and objects in a real world. It doesn't mean the real world doesn't exist. It just means that this particular moment isn't reliable. That's where we get on to the Malevolent Demon argument. Um, the Malevolent Demon is probably the strongest of his arguments, and he certainly thinks so. And he's He says in the Malevolent Demon argument that... Uh, there could be a demon giving us every thought. Now, that seems unbelievable, but um, it's not necessarily untrue. There's no argument against it. So, this demon could give us, giving us thoughts, would mean, of course, if it were true... And there is a possibility it is, and that's all we need, remember, that could be here. Well, then, I have to doubt everything, every thought I have. This is all in Meditation 1, so the first chapter in his book, and he ends it by saying that I have to doubt that I am a physical being as well. No eyes, no hands, no feet, he says. I have, at this point, to consider the possibility that my physical self does not exist. But, and this is the big bit, but, I know that I exist. Because even if there is a malevolent demon here, tricking me, there's still very much a me that exists. Or, I th cogito ergo sum, I think, therefore I am. I can doubt everything, but I can't doubt that I'm thinking without thinking that I'm not thinking and therefore thinking. That sounds complicated. Rewind and uh, watch that bit again. So the basically the idea is I exist definitely as a mind. I exist as a mind. Well, what about the body, though? If we've got this mind that exists here, what about the body? Does that exist? Well, Descartes thinks that he can prove that the body exists. He first of all gets rid of the malevolent demon by prove, well, thinking that he proves the existence of God. And we'll talk about his proof for the existence of God later on in another tutorial. But after he's done that, he then moves on to an argument for the external world. And this is his unwanted sensations argument, which he thinks proves that the body exists. He says, look, you have a whole load of unwanted sensations. I've drawn here pain, but you have loads of others too. If they're unwanted, they can't come from me uh, because they are unwanted, right? So they must be from the outside world. Which, of course, I would have to have a body in order to interact with. So the world exists now. And not just the world, but the body exists too. I know that says word, not world. But I only know that because I... I shaded it in. There you go. Highlighting. Really important. So, he's so far doubted everything, doubted the existence of the physical, proved that he exists as a mind, at least, and then proved that his body exists. This all builds towards his argument for dualism. And that's where we've got to at last, which is his conceivability argument. Simply put, these two things could, at least conceivably, be separate. Conceivably means that I can imagine it, basically, without any contradiction. So, it could they could be separate, because I there was a point at which I got to this stage where I knew that my mind must exist, but I didn't know that my body exists. And if they could be separate, they must be distinct. Think of it like this. I, you know, if I um, I, I can conceive of water 
and I can conceive of H2O, but I know that when I'm thinking of one, I'm also thinking of the other. I can't think of water that isn't H2O. That doesn't make any sense. So they couldn't be separate, therefore they're not distinct. But I can think of uh, coffee, coffee beans and water as being distinct, or I can think of it as a cup of coffee. So I can think of them as separate before I make the coffee, and then I can think of it uh, when they're mixed, but they are still distinct entities, the beans and the coffee. So I can conceive of these being separate, therefore they must be distinct. But of course they're not just distinct things, they do also interact. He says, look, it's, it's, it's a very close kind of interaction. He says, you know, imagine you're a, a kind of a sailor on a ship and uh, you're, a, you know, you're a captain and you're, you're guiding the ship like the mind guides the brain, but then the ship gets hull. Oh, no, the ship's hulled. Ah, disaster strikes, water's flooding in, and you're very aware of that. It's, it's awful news, but you're aware of that not in a physical sense, you don't feel it. You just, as, a, as the captain, know that it's happening, right? Well, you're not like that when the body gets hulled. Let's say when you get a hole in your body, you very much feel that. Um, so it is, uh, it is a very close interaction. What we really mean by this this is a commentator, uh, George's Dicker, on this. He says that it, what Descartes means is, is essentially they are mixed. Okay, so that's it. That's Cartesian dualism for you.